uh, originally from New Zealand. I started my career in the public sector. Um, I made a little bit of a career transition. I initially trained as a park ranger. And uh, this is one of New Zealand's national parks. Uh, happens to surround highest mountain in New Zealand. Can you raise your hand if you've been to New Zealand, please? Okay. Can you raise your hand if you'd like to go to New Zealand, please? Okay, second group, you need to meet the folks from the first group. <laughs> I also um, then kind of came out of the woods, as they say, and started to work in um, municipal government and state government and various um, park and recreation related roles. And um, at that point, being a much younger and skinnier man um, is when I first came to the United States and I worked for the US Forest Service um, on uh, the highest mountain in Oregon. Bonus question, anybody know? It's a volcano there. It's a volcano there, Mount Hood. Yeah. So I was a, uh, I was a ranger um, on uh, Mount Hood National Forest. And um, some people would think that's the absolute dream job. Uh, and I didn't really like it. And I decided that I would um, go to graduate school and get a little more education and see where things led. I applied to a bunch of different places um, and was accepted at the University of Illinois. And the reason the Greyhound bus is there is because I caught a Greyhound bus from Portland, Oregon to Urbana-Champaign, Illinois. And I will offer a free delicious cookie to whoever can get closest into guessing how long that bus ride would be. Total time, on the bus, off the bus. But I had the kind of ticket that you have to keep making transfers, but you can't not make a transfer or you gotta buy a new ticket. 72 hours. 72, 36, 36 48. 48. Oh, free cookie. You're very close. <laughs> yeah, 62 hours nonstop. So this actually represents the last time I ever rode a Greyhound bus. <laughs> so I did both of my graduate degrees. Um, and the more I started studying um, administration and public sector, uh, the more I realized that Everything has to do with people. And um, I was particularly interested in that aspect of people management that related to making people and the organizations they work in better tomorrow than they are today. And that really became uh, the focus of my research as well as my uh, career at the University of Minnesota, where I've been since I started in 1999. But I don't just work, I also climb mountains. This is me on the highest mountain in my home country, which was a pretty cool experience. It's not that high by world standards, about 12,500 feet. Um, but the amazing thing is from the summit, you can see people walking their dogs along the beach. <laughs> So it kind of drops off quite dramatically. So then um, I got uh, this idea, you know, if, if uh, I'm from New Zealand, I've climbed the highest mountain there, but now I live in the United States in Minnesota, I should climb the highest mountain in Minnesota, <laughs> which is Eagle. Eagle Mountain. Kevin, where is it? It's on the North Shore. It's on the North Shore off the Gunflint Trail, technically in the Boundary Waters, but you don't need a canoe to get there. Who's been there? Couple, all right. So there's this big brass plaque that says, you're at the top of Minnesota. And I thought, hey, that's pretty cool. I'm actually at the highest place of the state that I live in. Um, but hold on, there's actually 50 states in the country that I now call home. What would it take to stand on the highest point of all 50 states. And so began a quest that um, resulted in me being the first New Zealander to achieve it. Um, only the third 
non-US born. Um, Pre-COVID, about 400 people a year will summit Mount Everest, 400 a year. Less than 300 total ever have done all 50 state high points. So if you ever wanna uh, have me back to talk about something totally unrelated to workforce, um, I love talking about climbing and uh, the amazing experiences. Um, it culminated, I saved the mountain in Oregon where I had first worked and uh, summited on uh, uh, Mount Hood back in 2009 and have, have uh, since kind of transferred the hobby into international. And my goal is to uh, stand on the summit of 50 countries. Uh, I'm up to 38 with some big ones done, uh, a lot in Europe, uh, Kilimanjaro in Africa, uh, Chimborazo in Ecuador. Um, so this is what I do to balance the work demands. And um, there may be a correlation between the level of risk, but um, what I really focus on is, is the outcomes and the process of developing human resources. And I need to take just a quick sidetrack here. Um, when we say HR, in the research realm of HR are two separate but related fields. One is HRM, human resource management, and the other is HRD, human resource development. We like each other, we get on fine, we see the world a little bit differently, we use different theories a little bit differently, and therefore the kind of activity, the kind of uh, work that we do is a little bit different. Human resource management is that aspect of managing human resources having a strategic plan, recruiting them, paying them, making sure you're legally compliant, um, training and developing of them, uh, union uh, relations, if that's an aspect. So a broad range of activity related to managing people and organizations. Human resource development is all of that activity to make individuals and organizations better tomorrow than they are today. So my students don't take a course in pay or compensation or benefits. They take a whole bunch in training and leadership development and um, strategic planning for training and development. So I am in the College of Education and Human Development. Now, most people, when you say, oh, College of Education, University of Minnesota, you think teacher training. And sure, uh, we have teachers who are training. Um, of the total population of the student body, College of Education, less than 5% are training to be teachers. So for a variety of reasons at the University of Minnesota and many other large research universities, human resource development is in the College of Education and Human Development because that's where we're taking our body of research, body of theory to apply to making individuals and organizations better today than they are tomorrow. So. We go to the same conferences as the HR people. If I was HRM, I would be in the Carlson School of Management. Um, but the way that, that I was trained, the way that philosophically aligns with how I see the world is through this education, human development, developing human capital perspective. So um, a lot of my research focuses on employee engagement. Um, how do you have employees that when they show up to work, 
they make a voluntary decision of how much of themselves are they going to bring to work. And what do you have to do as an organizational leader for them day after day after day to bring and volunteer all of themselves? We think of employee engagement as a survey. How many of you work for a company that does a survey that might in part ask about employee engagement? That's a tiny, tiny, tiny part of what employee engagement is about. I also look at a lot of, of leadership development, um, do a lot of this work all over the world. And then the last part, um, and mostly my focus for this evening, is on workforce planning. Uh, how do you make sure you have the people you need to get the work you need done? So when we think about workforce shortage and workforce planning, um, the old iceberg model comes up again. And um, most organizations are not very good at looking below the waterline. But you've got to understand what's happening below the waterline if you want to plan to have the right number of people with the right skill set aligned to the jobs that you need them to do. And what tends to happen is we're in such a hurry to get the work done, we jump right to recruiting without thinking in a planful way, what do we really need and how are we gonna make sure that we get those right people? Because when you do that, you increase the likelihood that you have the right people who are highly engaged with their work. So you don't have them asking, should I use oils or pastels for your spreadsheet? <laughs> so one of the other things that um, I want to frame my remarks is that um, as a social scientist, I'm really comfortable in nonlinear type situations. And there are all sorts of historic approaches to management that kind of treat people like a machine. And we all know they're not. And so really want to think in terms of both sort of a systems perspective, as well as to the sort of um, double loop learning approach. So um, here's where I transition to talking about this uh, MnDOT report, which you can find on the MnDOT and the LLRB website. Our purpose was to explore causes of workforce shortage in Minnesota's public transportation agency. Um, there was serious concern um, about not really understanding, but knowing that something was going on between uh, technical workers like surveyors in the field and engineers, because historically how those two labor markets operated seemed to be operating really differently. And um, last part was to sort of understand how are Minnesota's public agencies recruiting and retaining people and identify some new strategies that could be considered by agencies. So uh, I'm not gonna spend a whole bunch of time talking about how we did it, but um, lots of different forms of data. Um, is there anybody in the room that doesn't know about Glassdoor, a website called Glassdoor? Everybody heard of that? Okay, for something really fun, go to glassdoor.com and type in the name of your firm or agency. If you're the owner of that firm, have a stiff drink in your hand. 
It is horrendously biased. And it's a brilliant insight to what your employees think of your firm, if any of them have filled it out. So I wanted to really understand across the state of Minnesota, public agencies, everything from a survey questionnaire to interviews to analyzing what are people writing on Glassdoor? Because I really wanted to try and get as complete a picture of, as I could of what in the world is going on. Because I heard all the stories that we used to have a vacancy in our county for a road engineer and we'd have 80, 100 applicants. They're all great. We'd interview five. We'd hire somebody and they'd stay for life and they were brilliant. And we heard in the introduction kind of the reality of what it's like now. More vacancies and applicants. So um, at a key part of this study, uh, COVID arrived. But um, before I get into that, what we were able to determine that the number one driver of what's happening to labor market changes is demographic. And we tend to operate in our bubble. So our view of the world is based on those communities in which we're interacting most with. So you may not be fully aware of demographic changes happening across the state or in the whole labor market, because in the organization you work in, in the community in which you live and shop, you're not as aware of how that labor market in total is changing. One of the things in my industry that we're terrified about, and it's coming right on the heels of a pandemic, is what we're calling the enrollment cliff. There's about to be, as cyclically happens, there's about to be a period with way fewer high school students. And we've got infrastructure, systems, expenses based on a completely different demographic reality. Those colleagues of mine who are in school districts that are saying, yeah, you know, they're laying off teachers. There's not enough kids. That gives me an insight into what's coming our way. So the biggest, biggest takeaway was that you have to understand the impact of changing dynamics on the demographic composition, composition of your labor market. That is not just race, ethnicity, age, but it also gets into really messy stuff like values. Like, what do you mean I had to be here at seven o'clock? 7.30 seemed a bit more than early enough for me. Thank you very much. <laughs> right? So if there's one takeaway from tonight, what, what's a starting point of action? We have in the state of Minnesota, some fabulous state agencies that produce demographic data. And you need, someone in your organization needs to be paying attention to that information and what might that mean in the context of our labor market. Huge shift relatedly, happening in outstate rural Minnesota and urban. Um, a lot of the next generation of workers do not want to work anywhere other than a large city. 
It's not a matter of how attractive is the job, what is it paying, they want to be in the seat. Sure, there are some who would love to be a county engineer, but you're going to have to work harder to find them. With this demographic shift, the reality of the labor, the physical and emotional expenditure to get the job done has significantly changed. And there continues to be significant issues around compensation pay for skills. And no doubt many of you work for organizations where you're hiring some new people to get them, you may be messing up your whole salary structure because of salary compression of people that you hired only three or four years ago. And in many organizations, mine included, we have a two week window where you can complain to your boss about your salary. And we'll take a look at salary compression and equity. Then you got 50 weeks to wait. Can't do that anymore. You've got to have someone in HR constantly vigilant for how salary aligns with the skills that you need. So why were people leaving? People were really concerned about lack of career mobility, lack of advancement, an uncertain career path, work-life balance issues. And this one was really surprising in the public sector the number of people that said, I just don't trust my agency. Managers say one thing, but I don't trust them. And that's something that as an organizational leader, you can do something about, and you should. So in summary, um, changing dem demography must mean we change the way we think about workforce planning and the management of people. It, if the characteristics of the demographic and the value characteristics of our employees are changing, therefore, the way we plan for the workforce and manage that workforce must change. Labor market competition, the new multi-year window on the labor market is that talent shortages are gonna get more and more pronounced. So you're gonna to have to have a really interesting discussion and decision as a company. Are we gonna make our talent or buy our talent? Or what mix? And how do we plan and then execute that HR strategy. Recruitment, retention, and talent development must be reconsidered. Just because it's the way we've always done it, doesn't work. Here's a great example. I was talking with a engineer in a rural county who was having all sorts of difficulty recruiting. And he said, the problem is our HR. We have a, we have a county level uh, ordinance that says county government. We can, we must advertise our local, uh, we must advertise our vacancies in our local newspapers. And he was almost proud of himself. He says, but you know what? I sneak in an ad to the Star Tribune. I said, what's your uh, online recruiting strategy like? Oh, we don't have anyone who does that. <laughs> uh, when's the last time you saw someone age, under the age of 24 read a county newspaper looking for a job? Of all the things that have interrupted speeches over the year, this may be the first. I think we're in a pretty safe place. Um, 
Iya. <laughs> you let me know if it is, Chuck. <laughs> so, when I spoke with HR at this agency, they said, oh, we'd like to change, but we can't. There's your problem. So the way you do things as an organization, the way you do HR must, must, must change. So I could, um, I could spend a lot of time talking about this slide. Um, it's the basis of a whole series of different workshops that I do. I'd be happy to come and speak any one of your firms, um, about different approaches to workforce planning. And this is what a lot of organizations do. You know, oh my God, we need three people to do. So there's nothing strategic about it what I call pants on fire HR. And then you get really frustrated because HR don't move at the speed you want them to move at. You need to be thinking constantly on a rolling, rotating basis of this one month, 12 year, 18 months time horizon. And then overlay that with a more strategic two to 10 year. But you also got to be paying increasing attention, what is the future of work? What, what are those next generation of workers? Because if you think based on the comedy routine that got us started tonight, that the generation of workers that are now showing up to your jobs are different, Wait till you meet the students that I've been teaching this semester. <laughs> you ain't seen nothing yet. Okay. So that's kind of a good segue to this little thing. What if I showed you this three years ago? None of us would have had a clue, right? Is this one of grandma's arts and crafts projects or one of those sort of Guess what this is thing? So COVID's changed everything. So what I'd like you to do at your table um, is I'd like you to talk. What do you think the most pressing changes to the workforce from COVID will be firstly in the next one year, immediate? and more long time, three to five years. Go. So what we'll do is we'll go around. Uh, we'll start off with the most immediate. Oh, yeah. Yep. Expectation work remotely. Expectation, big fat salary, and really good benefits. This table. I, I'm going to paraphrase that as an increasing disconnect between the reality of HR professionals and workers. HR is out of touch. Okay, back table. Yeah, buzzword for the next few months is gonna be employee socialization. Right. We do that for new hires, but I bet we've all kind of forgotten a little bit how to be civil, how to act, right? And it's gonna be so highly individualized, right? Kevin may wanna have a conversation and I'm just, right? I'm just gonna be just a little bit further back. Kevin thinks that's a bit rude and walks towards me, okay? I'm headed, right? So we're going to have to re-socialize in either a virtual or a uh, physical office space. This side of the room, we're going to go with three to five years. 
all of our norms and expectations around workplace communication are going to change. Yep. And, and, and here's the bad news. When we talk about employee engagement with the next generation of workers, no, so here's the big thing with employee engagement. We have been terrible role models. Yeah, and here's the, here's the difficult thing, and, and, and uh, Chuck was asking me about data. Um, I know folks from an engineering background love data. But you have to disaggregate the data so much that it's hard to get patterns. So in my profession, we have this thing that's almost impossible to explain called tenure. <laughs> right? Job for life. It's kind of hard to explain it to a crowd like this. I was doing annual review with one of my tenured faculty, late 40s, married, no kids. He said, you know what the last two years has shown me? I don't want to be in higher education anymore. Nobody walked away from a tenured job. They are now. So people are staying on. Other people are saying, hey, this isn't what I really want to do. But we haven't always been the best example to young people when we prioritize work. And we would come home every day and say, oh, the commute today sucked so much. They're like, I don't want to live in the suburbs and commute, right? That's why they're building more apartments than you could imagine downtown. They want to walk to a Starbucks on the way to work. Actually, they'd rather work at home after they've been to the Starbucks still in their pajamas, <laughs> right? Anything from this table? We haven't heard. So I have banned in my department, we are no longer saying return to normal or the new normal. Both of those terms mean you've got to put $5 in the swear jar and we make, a, we make a donation to the woman's shelter. There is no normal about what's coming next. It's a new now. And part of that new now really depends on whether you're a glass half full or a glass half empty, both individual and organization. I'm a huge believer in how you choose to look at things determines the things you look at. So are we in a workforce crisis or is this one of the greatest opportunities for us to really make sure we get the right people we need. I'm more on that side. So I think one of the really big things is we've got to stop the language that privileges organization performance. Yeah, I know quarterly profit and loss, all of that stuff will never go away. But we want to be the most effective organization we can be. And that's a different mindset and that influences policies different than a performative privileged orientation. We've got to get real about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And that makes folks like the majority of us in this room uncomfortable. Lean in. We're the ones predominantly in positions of power and influence. And we've got to get this diversity, equity, and inclusion thing. Not lip service. But I encourage you to fully commit. What am I going to do this year, this month? to educate myself more on this stuff. 
And if it's making you feel uncomfortable and squirm just a little bit that you don't want to do it, that you know it, that's the signal that you just made the right decision to commit to learning more about this. There will be radical shifts in what work means to people, what success means, and there will be radical shifts in the kind of labor needed for organizations. There will be rapid, persistent, and deep structural changes impacting whole industry segments faster than we can predict. And back to Sean, yep. Yep, back to Sean's comment. There's so much knowledge in the head of silver haired employees. In fact, interestingly, in, in the indigenous culture of my homeland, New Zealand, the word for gray hair translates as silver haired fountain of wisdom. How do we as organizations, how do we as a society get that wisdom out of the head of the silver hairs and transferred into our organization? So here's kind of um, second to last point I want to leave you with. The change happening to people at work will now be constant, complex, and consequential. We tend to think of change as episodic. You know, some of the old change models unfreeze, move, refreeze, like pre-change, change, post-change. Post -change. What if it's just constant white water, constant churn? Because it will be. But I've been collecting these publicity things from HR because I think they're outdated. You know, HR used to do stickers and maybe have one day where they would sort of really kind of promote themselves and, you know, HR is the service part of the organization to provide you with the HR needs. My new thinking is it's all about the people, all the people. So, even though you do not have HR guru on your business card as your job title, I need you to start thinking like one to help your company. Okay, I'm going to be really blunt. If we leave the people issues right now to our HR departments, we're in big trouble. They can't do it. They're wanting to place a want ad in the county newspaper. They're getting you a beverage engineer. <laughs> they're going to they're gonna break all sorts of speed records and approve your new position request in one month. And don't ask any other favors in the coming year, no, right? You have to become a partner with HR. We have a saying in New Zealand, what's the most important thing in the world? It's people, it's people, it's people. I'm gonna give you an exercise. I'm gonna give you just 20 seconds. I'm gonna be watching the clock really carefully, okay? This is an individual exercise, okay? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call on you. So you got to, this is all about performance. I'm sorry, this isn't effectiveness. This is performance, okay? In only 20 seconds, I want you to think of an idea that's never been thought of before. Go. 
No one's ever thought of this idea. This is a brand new idea. Time's up. Who found that difficult? Okay. Try this one then. I'll be a little more generous. I'm going to give you 30 seconds. I want you to think of an idea for recruiting people that has not been done at your organization before. Who's got one? Sean? Social media ads. Cool. Someone else? Social media ads. What else? Something your organization hasn't done. Somehow get, get uh, away from the, the keyword searches through the applicants. So yeah, right. Get away from algorithms and software that our HR firm uses to screen. Okay. Let, let me just rant on this just for a second. <laughs> the thinking, the mindset, the philosophy behind that software. Let's just, let's just think about the sequential timing here. You're using, your HR is using software to screen applicants that sucks. <laughs> when was that developed? Well, it was developed long ago that it could be tested by either IT geeks, that it could be marketed probably some venture capital, a couple of acquisitions of consulting firms there, for the price to come down low enough for your organization to buy it. I'm guessing the mindset, the philosophy behind those algorithms is 10 years at least. Other than my friend Chris, how many of you have a 10-year-old cell phone? <laughs> right? Because those algorithms don't work for us anymore. The mindset in that device needs to be more current. I want you to think of an idea for retaining people that your organization hasn't done before. 30 seconds. Say it louder. Go, Mitch. Everybody gets FaceTime with uh, senior leadership, and it's just like a big checklist. First thing came to my mind. Perfect. Brilliant. Everybody gets FaceTime with CEO. What else? Parenting. Hey. Merit based pay. Yeah. <laughs> what else? Okay, it's getting late and we're stuck in a basement. I know, I know. One more. <laughs> What's an idea for training, development, advancing people that has not been done before at your organization? Who's got one? Well, I know personally, I have people that report to me now and you know, senior management doesn't give a shit. <laughs> really but like it's my it's in my best interest to develop a relationship with these young people yeah and mentor them and like make sure they're happy and i mean that's not necessarily my job description but yes it is it's like my it's just not typed out yeah. but yes it is you know yeah they're like my friends yeah right yeah if you're going to spend more time at work than with the people who love you and you love, you better be getting on with these people and feel good about their skill set. So Ian didn't say this, but l l let's provide some training and mentoring and coaching for your level managers. All right? What else is your company not doing? I'd, I'd like to know how you think this varies with age. What varies with age? Well, generally what you've been talking about, asking questions about. And is that, is that for 20 year olds, very, very different? Yes, people. So we make, we make a big deal about generational differences. What's the greatest predictor 
in the workforce. For any outcome, performance, attitude, when you run the statistics on generational cohort, you might find a difference, but it's probably gonna be statistically insignificant. The greatest predictor, individual variation. I know that's messy if you're an engineer. Right? That means getting to know people. But there are some patterns, but you've got to be really cautious of what I call generational generalization. So the chief financial officer says, hey, you're talking about all these new ideas for training. What if we train people when they leave? And I train my students to say, what if we don't train people and they stay? So this is my last point. In the HR literature, there's this idea of becoming an employer of choice. You don't have to pay the most. You don't have to have the best benefits. You can be rural, suburban, urban. But you're an employer of choice. Build on your strengths. I want you to feel empowered. I want you to feel you must share these ideas with HR. You might have to build a relationship with HR so they, right, we got some bad blood there. HR doesn't understand us. We don't understand HR. We got a relationship built. But everybody in a position of management and influence is responsible for helping HR. They're not going to come up with new novel ideas of how to recruit the kind of workers you need. They're more than willing to help when they can see and trust that you're trying to help them. So opportunity for doing what people feel good about and helping other humans and the planet. That is a generational difference that young people feel really strong about. So if it's working for city government in this job, you're not measuring the yards of sidewalk concrete. You're providing a really important public service. We've got to get serious on work-life fit. Notice the word balance is not there. Autonomy around employee engagement, a climate of respect, trust, and belonging. Continuous, not once a year annual review, continuous attention to career mobility and advancement. And how do you make jobs challenging, fun, so people are learning? So I um, would like to ask you to do three things um, for the rest of, uh, until your next meeting. Determine if your organization has a strategic HR plan. Begin to assess what are the core people issues in your organization and related to the work you're doing and need to do. And then think about some of that workforce planning approaches. Happy for you to email me at any time. Happy to come and um, engage with you and your firm around continuing the conversation. I just want to Thank you for choosing to spend your time here tonight when I know there were tornadoes and severe weather events that you could have participated in. Thank you very much. Right, right there's the answer to his question. Right? I tell you what, it's also not. It's not, when I started at this company, I was in the broom closet. I worked there three years, but right? They don't want to hear that. 
So don't share that. Right? This is a this next generation have never had to wait for anything. So don't do an annual performance review. Don't even do a monthly performance review. All right? How many of you have got kids or had kids in school? All right? How many times did they have a test? They were getting feedback constantly. All right. I'm so old, when I went to college, the whole course came down to the final exam. It freaks out students today, right? So how can you find out what do they need? What, what would you like in terms of getting feedback from me? Now they're gonna say, I don't want any criticism. Right. Well, critique is not criticism. We might have to spend some time on a YouTube. How do you give constructive feedback? How do you give tough news in a supportive way. Pretty sure most of the formal education that comprises this room didn't involve courses in those kind of topics. But that's why I'm now advocating a big chunk of your job is people management and growing people. Other questions? If I, if I could paraphrase, I yeah. think he said something about the fact that Americans don't like to work anymore. How, how did you react to that statement? Do you believe in it, or do you think he's trying to shake something up, or what, what's your feeling? Um, so Elon Musk said Americans don't like to work. What's my reaction to it? Firstly, it's not just Americans. <laughs> <laughs> But secondly, we do want to work, right? I, I know some people who are amazing at what they do in their spare time. So it's not a matter of they're not engaged. Some of them have worked for me. Low quality, bad attitude. But then five minutes earlier, shoot out the door and they go and do, I don't know, play the guitar or sport or, right? Climb There's mountains. climb mountains. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right? And they're totally into it. They're investing a lot of time, a lot of effort. They're getting better every single day. They want to, right? So what is it about our work? So if I were meeting with Elon or if I was still on Twitter um, and were to send him a tweet, I would say, what are we doing? that has driven disengagement. So when I do an employee engagement seminar, one of the questions I love to ask, do you remember your first day of work at where you are now? What do you remember about that day? Now, for some of us, it was a while ago, right? What do you remember about that first day at work? Anyone? Being engaged. Did anybody buy new shoes or at least clean them? Did you get there early? You were fully, fully prepared to give 105%. I want you to think of the most disengaged employee. 
because I've done research where I ask people their engagement profile. And then I ask them to tell me as much as they can remember about their first day of work. People have vivid memories about this, folks. They can go on for a really long time about their first day of work. I got there early. My wife bought me a new shirt. I was so excited. And then I asked what happens. And guess what the answer is? Management happened. Managers drove them to be disengaged employees. Nobody wakes up one morning and says, yeah, done with, it, you know. Right? So I think one of the really, really big things is those of us in leadership and management positions, we've forgotten to continually feed the fire so that people make that choice. So when people first were hired, they, they knew, hey, if I'm doing really well after six months, I might get promoted. And now they've been there for two years and no one's even mentioned the word promoted to them. Is that their fault for not hearing it or our fault for not saying it? So I think the biggest change is, is not that Americans don't want to work. I think that work has forgotten the importance of connecting and engaging employees.